Good morning and welcome to St Andrew's Brighton on the third Sunday after Pentecost. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for the sake of Jesus Christ will find it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised to forgive all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Gracious God, we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We pray that as you raised him from death, so by the power of the Holy Spirit we may live the new life to your glory, knowing ourselves to be dead to sin but alive for you in Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. From the Holy Bible, God's Word, we have a reading from the Old Testament book of Esther. So the king and Haman went to a feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, 
What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition and the lives of my people. That is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. However, no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then Habona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Harmon has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Harmon's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Harmon on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Hedar, and also the 15th day of the same month, year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, and from morning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Above all, my beloved, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, 
and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Well, hello again this week as we uh, bring God's word from uh, Mark chapter 9 to us. I'm, this week I'm at uh, Christchurch Berwick, and thank you for their hospitality for the recording of the sermon this week. Let me again read the passage, and then uh, we'll pray. From Mark 9, verse 38 to 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we pray that your word will dwell richly in our hearts, challenge us, encourage us, and strengthen us to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus. Amen. I should be dead. My hands should be cut off, my eyes cut out, my feet cut off, my ears removed, my tongue removed, and in the end, my heart removed. I should be dead, and we all should, in fact, be dead. If we take this passage of Jesus literally, we should be dead. All our limbs chopped off, and eyes and ears, and Everything from which sexual motive or sexual activity, uh, sorry, sinful activity and sinful motive has come. Jesus back in chapter 7 said that it's from the heart that all things unclean come. And so without the heart from which our uncleanness comes, we should all be dead. Taken literally, Jesus' words are more ruthless than the Taliban, I suspect. So what does he mean? by this pretty challenging statement. Well, just a bit earlier in the previous chapter of Mark, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for the disciples, answered, as we well know, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And what flows from then on in Mark's gospel, as Jesus turns from the north of the country at Caesarea Philippi, heading south towards Jerusalem, is now more about the, the discipleship of following Jesus than indeed the public ministry of drawing attention to himself and to who he is. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. What does it mean now to follow this Messiah, this Jesus? He just declares, and so far twice, once more to come in the next chapter, that he will go to die. Peter had objected to that back in chapter 8 in the previous chapter. Jesus uh, 
predicts his destiny of suffering and rejection, betrayal and a cross. And it's in that context that he said in the previous chapter, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And now in a way he fills out a bit more detail about what it means to deny yourself and to follow Jesus. What does that mean? What does it imply? Well, earlier in chapter 9, the disciples could not cast out an evil spirit or a demon from a boy. They failed to do it. And Jesus, in effect, rebuked them afterwards, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you? But now the disciples have seen a man, whom they don't know this man, casting out an evil spirit in Jesus' name. And so maybe it's in the context of, well, we couldn't do that. Why can this man? We're on the in-group with Jesus. We're following Jesus. Three of us were up on the mountain of transfiguration at the beginning of this very chapter with Jesus. So who is this man using Jesus' name able to do what, what we couldn't do? So we tried to stop him, Jesus. We tried to tell him that he, he couldn't do that. He couldn't use your name and claim allegiance in a way with you. He's not part of the in-group as we are. And it's now John who speaks for the disciples. John who, with Peter and James, was on the Mount of Transfiguration, part of the inner sanctum, the inner circle of this group of 12 disciples. John tells Jesus about this man whom they rebuked and tried to stop. And Jesus now rebukes them in turn. And what Jesus demonstrates in this rebuke is that a narrow exclusivism of the followers of Jesus does not fit who Jesus is. He said to John, and presumably with all the disciples there, don't, don't stop him. For no one does a deed of power in my name who will able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. You can't cast out a demon in Jesus' name and turn around and say Jesus is evil. That is, there's some element of faith, maybe some element of understanding. We don't know who this man is. We don't know how he's known about Jesus, but the crowds have known something. And Jesus rebukes the disciples for rejecting this man from being part of the followers of Jesus. And it's not just the big miracles that count, because Jesus goes from the, the miracle of the man, don't stop him, to then speak about the smallest act of hospitality you can imagine. Truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, the Messiah that is, will by no means lose the reward. That is, whether it's a big miracle of casting out a demon in Jesus' name, or whether it's offering just a glass of water to a follower of Jesus because they bear the name of the Christ, the Messiah, whom Peter has declared earlier, they won't lose the reward. Denying oneself and following Jesus means that I'm not the center of the in-group. John's not the center of the in-group, or Peter either. Jesus is commanding a greater following than even the 12 disciples themselves recognize. Where, where that man's from, we don't know, and it doesn't matter. But rather that if people are claiming the name of Jesus and doing good, whether it's a miracle or whether it's an act of uh, small hospitality with water, Jesus is implying they're on his side. If they're not against me, they're for me, in effect. They're following me. And the offering of a glass of water is being like a servant of all, which we saw in the previous passage earlier in chapter 9. Church history is littered with the fracture of churches, and often, not all, or not always, and often for not good reasons. Often the fracturing of churches is because of ego, desire for power, a sense of self-righteousness. And what happens is that ever tighter boundaries around who is in and who is out are drawn. What Jesus, I think, is challenging here to, to John and the 12 disciples is that deny yourself and follow Jesus will lead to a generous spirit and a broad inclusivism, recognizing that there's a whole range of people who will follow Jesus because Jesus is Lord of all, the Messiah of all. He's bigger than we are. Well, second, denying yourself for Jesus' sake means that you'll do anything 
not to cause a stumbling block to another Christian. That is, you'll put aside your own rights and certainly your own sins so as not to literally scandalize another. The word for stumbling block is the word from which we get the word scandal, to upset, to derail, uh, to, to cause someone to stumble, slip, fall away, that sort of idea. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. Jesus has just had a a little child that he's brought and and said to them, um, you know, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. It may still be that there are little children with him, although it, it, it seems that in between times, The disciples have seen this other exorcist casting out demons. But perhaps there are children still around. Maybe Jesus is not referring just to little children physically, if you like, but rather little ones of faith, those of weak or shallow faith, perhaps. And he's saying, don't cause them to stumble. Don't cause them to derail their faith. And again, church history is littered with ungodly churches and ungodly Christians and ungodly Christian leaders who have led to people turning away from Christ. We know that well in Australia, how the shocking and and disgraceful behavior of child abuse has turned so much of our society away from not us, the church, so much, and that, that has happened, but even more importantly, turn people away from Jesus And how often in history the ungodliness of churches with regard to wealth, to power, the use of fraud as well as abuse and the internal conflict, the internal hatreds, the divisions between churches, the divisions between those who bear the name of Christ or claim the name of Christ have turned people away. Not so much from the church but from Jesus. What a scandal that is for 2,000 years. And Jesus is showing here, because he speaks about even one of these little ones, is that the little ones matter to him. What The people who matter to Jesus are not those in power, not those who are uh, the leaders of churches, the, the rich, the influential, the powerful, the famous, but even the little ones, the ones who are so often overlooked or ignored, the ones who so often are indeed scandalized in their faith. The Romans, we know, had a punishment that they did from time to time where they did tie large millstones around people's necks and throw them overboard from a ship, whether in the Mediterranean or even in the Sea of Galilee. This was a known punishment, basically. The large millstone would be drawn by a donkey to turn it around to grind grain. There were smaller millstones as well, but this is a large one that's referred to here. So this is a frightful punishment, the terrifying Nature of being thrown into water knowing that you had no option but to drown. Denying yourself means setting aside your own rights and putting away your own sins so that not even a little one would stumble in faith. That's part of being a servant of all, as Jesus had described it earlier in the chapter. It's worth asking ourselves, who are we as Christians and as churches Who are we turning away by our behavior to each other that draws people away from Jesus? But thirdly, denying yourself and following Jesus means that we do not stumble in sin. The person who baptized me almost 60 years ago, when I was a little baby, has just had a leg amputated in recent months in order to save and prolong his life. It's a man who's very elderly now, a retired clergy person in the Diocese of Melbourne. That amputation has caused him to live. Jesus now picks up that sort of language, but it it goes even stronger. And he says it, in effect, three ways, three times, to underscore the seriousness and severity of what he's saying. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. 
That's pretty ruthless behavior here. And the stumbling here is not physical. It's not just if you trip on a rock or something. It's not if you just sort of have a little mishap. But rather sin is the idea here. And Jesus is saying this sin, sin generally, is no light matter. It is serious to God and serious to Jesus. And what he's saying then in this threefold way is that whatever it takes, get rid of sin in your life. Why? To avoid hell at all costs. It's better for you to enter life maimed than have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Now, obviously, Jesus' words are metaphorical, but they don't lose their severity because of that and their importance either. Jesus is saying the absolute value of the kingdom of God trumps anything of this physical life. In the next chapter, he will speak about renouncing your possessions for the gospel, renouncing your family for Jesus' sake. And here, in effect, he's, he's got the same sort of theme. Deny yourself. Deny the sin in your life. Root it out. Eradicate it from your life. Do not flirt with the danger of hell. Well, our, our world flirts with sin. People joke about it all the time. We gossip, we boast, we lust and we lie. We're greedy, we're proud, we're self-centered. And we think, well, that's okay because that's what our world is like. Everybody does it and so do I. And we think it's okay as Christians because we think, well, God's forgiving, God's merciful. God will forgive me again and again. But grace is not cheap. It comes at the high cost of the cross. It demands my soul, my life and my all. Gone, it seems, almost entirely, is the pursuit of holiness of past eras of the church. And what a loss that is to us. Because we're so often seduced by our world to say that this world is what matters most, not eternal life. And we're so often duped not to see the radical supremacy of Jesus, the Messiah, and we're so often blinded to the realities of an eternity without God. Jesus' final words, if you like, draw this little theme together about, in effect, subjecting your whole body, rooting out anything to eradicate sin. And then he says, for everyone will be salted with fire. It's a new idea, this salt coming in. But in the Old Testament, sacrifices were often with salt, according to Leviticus. And so what Jesus is saying here, in effect, I think, is that subject your whole body as a sacrifice to God to get rid of sin, to be purified, to be tested, to be tried. For everyone will be salted with fire, and salt is good. That is, there is a fire that destroys and brings judgment, but a fire that purifies and tests and tries. And the end result of that purification, the end of verse 50, the end of the chapter, be at peace with one another. Which seems on the surface to be a, a, an almost new idea. But remember, just a bit earlier, the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest because they misunderstand what it means to deny yourself and follow Jesus. And of course, if you're leading a little one to stumble, then you're not at peace with them. And if you yourself are stumbling into sin, you're not at peace either with God or others. And their criticisms of the man who cast out the demon shows that they're excluding him and they're not at peace with him either. Because Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, as Peter declared in the previous chapter, because therefore Jesus is worth utterly everything in our lives, we are to deny ourselves and follow him. Denying ourselves and following him means that we recognize he's bigger than us. It's not about me, it's about him. And we have a generous inclusivism as we recognize people unlike us who nonetheless claim the name of Jesus. To deny ourselves and follow him means that we will do absolutely nothing that will cause a scandal, somebody else to stumble in their faith 
and turn them away from Jesus. And to deny ourselves and follow him will mean that we do absolutely everything to eradicate sin from our own lives so that we do not end up in hell. And we do so because Jesus is worth it. We do so because he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of all. And because only in following him is entry into the kingdom of God found. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that Jesus is Christ, Messiah, the Lord of all. And we pray that in response, you will help us more and more to deny ourselves and follow him. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Lord Jesus Christ, everlasting Son of the Father, who for our sakes humbled yourself, keep us to heed your call. Give us a spirit of humble service that we may reach out to others in love. Christ our Lord, who with the Father and the Son lives and reigns forever. Amen. Lord, you have called us to serve you. You have called us to heal. You have called us to love. Bless the work of the church in places of neglect and de deprivation. We pray for all who work in the healing ministries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who work in the world of commerce, for bankers, tax collectors, and insurance brokers. We remember all who are deeply in debt and cannot repay. We pray for countries where the national debt is crippling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, may we come reaching out to touch you. May we come in faith. We pray for those who brought us to your presence. We pray for homes where there is chronic illness or the illness of a child. Lord, in your mercy. We pray before you all who are outcasts. We pray for the brokenhearted and the broken spirited. We pray for all who find themselves in desperate situations, for all who are anxious about their health or the health of a loved one. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for all who have been restored by your touch and all whom you have raised from the point of death. We pray also for those who have recently departed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ said to all who turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear also what St John says. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. lost 
But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed Through many dangerous toils and snares I have already come T'was grace that brought me safe this far And grace will lead me home Been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Oh, we've no less days. To sing God's praise than when we first begun. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Up again. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who, by the power of your Spirit, was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the heavenly host, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them, may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace the gifts of God for the people of God. Living God, in this holy meal, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us. Give us courage for our pilgrimage and bring us to the joys you promise. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. The peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>